Welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining from. Uh, we're going to wait a few minutes for people to file in but be before we get started. But while we do, please say hello in the chat and let us know where we're uh, where you're coming from. Um, I think some of you were here for the first part of the series yesterday and we're excited to see you again. Um, if you're new today, uh, we'll be sharing the recording for yesterday's seminar. Um, the chat was really popping off yesterday, so we hope to see that uh, again today. Um, hello, Stephen and Robert. Good morning. Uh, yeah, let's just wait a few more seconds for people to join. Um, yeah, I am in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, good morning. Hello again, Kathy from Dublin. Thank you for joining us again. And we have someone from Turkey, Dubai. Wow, this is so great to see people from so many different areas. So exciting and from so many different time zones. So for those of you who, for whom it's very late, uh, thank you for being here again. Um, I think, uh, yeah, maybe let's, uh, Maybe let's get started and people who missed the beginning can catch up on the recording later. Um, Abby, would you like to begin the slideshow? Uh, so good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Oh, hang on, oh, hang on one second. Um, welcome to Nothing Ventured, Nothing Gained. Um, my name is Gabriella Ortega Ricketts. I am a, uh, as a visual, visual description, I am a uh, light-skinned Colombian American woman with kind of unruly, wavy, short brown hair and bangs. I'm wearing a colorful checkered shirt. Oops, sorry about that. I'm wearing a colorful checkered shirt. Uh, and I have, um, a white wall with the photo of this Irish pig behind me. Um, uh, and I am the manager of artist programs here at IDA. So this is part two of Nothing Ventured, Nothing Gained, Getting Started, a workshop that we devised um, about getting started in documentary and how to kind of begin to navigate all of the various things that are required for filmmaking. Before we get started, I would like to quickly, quickly introduce um, my co-facilitators and co-divisors uh, of this of this uh, series, Maria Santos and Abby Sun. We did our full introductions yesterday, so if you want to look at those in more depth, you can uh, in the recording. Um, so Maria and Abby, would you like to briefly say hello before we get into the meat of the seminar? Thanks so much, Gabriella. I'm Abby Sun. I'm the director of artist programs at the International Documentary Association. And I am a light-skinned Asian woman with shoulder-length black hair. And today I'm wearing a striped tank top. I'm sitting in a very, very white room and you can just see the corner of a bookshelf. Maria, I'll pass it to you. Maria, you're I'm muted. I'm sorry about that. Um, good morning. Just the excitement. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maria Santos. Um, I am the IDA Funds Program Officer, and um, I we did a big bio yesterday, so please feel free to look at that recording um, from yesterday. But I am a brown, chubby woman with uh, long black hair that's actually tied up in a bun right now. And I have two little hoops happening and a uh, purple dress. Um, and I'm sitting in front of a white background as well. Um, and I use she, her pronouns. It's nice to meet all of you again. Thank you so much, uh, Abby and Maria. Um, I also use she, her pronouns. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. And we are joining you today from the um, uh, from the from Los Angeles or the Chumash territory and Gabrielino uh, Tongva territory. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, 
Uh, great. Okay, so getting started. Next slide, please. Diving into funding. So to begin, let's do a brief recap of what we learned yesterday. Oh, sorry, a, an agenda of um, what we're doing today. So we're going to with a brief recap of what we've learned so far and then talk about how to know what stage you're at in your production and the different stages of um, making a film, some information as we promised on navigating funding and pitching, uh, and also budgeting, which I know is a very prevalent question on everybody's minds. Then we're going to go into uh, artist labs and grants, which uh, may be a little bit more un unfamiliar to some of you. And then um, we're going to go back into our mental health section about navigating stress and burnout, which we all know is a very real thing that we we face. Um, next slide, please. So what have we learned so far? Some words of caution and encouragement. So as a little refresher to yesterday, which again will be shared if you missed it, and even if you just want to watch it again, um, when conceiving of your project, there are some things to keep in mind, which is how do you frame your project? Where does it fit in the landscape? How, what kind of film do you wanna make? Um, and also the importance of building community and support and some tips for that. And I was really, I loved seeing in the chat, the support and community that was just being built in the chat. It was so like, really, really, I can't express how wonderful it was to see. There was even a Discord that popped off that that started. Um, so if anyone has the link that they want to share to that, please do. Um, and then we also discussed a few resources for mental health, which again, we will get more into um, at the end of today's session. So now I'm going to pass it off to Maria. Um, Maria, do you want to tell us what stage we're at and how we can figure that out? Sure thing. Thanks, Gabriella. Um, so yeah, so yesterday we started talking about, you know, framing your uh, film and the context that you have to develop in order to talk about your film, not just its contents, but actually the framing of it, what uh, methodologies you're using, um, what formal elements you're using. And another way to describe your film are also the stages of production. Um, and so there are traditionally four different stages of production that are most often re uh, referenced. That's development, pre-production, production, and post-production. Um, and though they are often thought to be linear and usually in fiction and narrative fiction, that's usually the case, right? It starts with development, then pre-production, then production, then post-production. We know that in nonfiction, linear is actually not the way we work. Um, sometimes we have to jump back and forth. And so we'll go into those details um, as we go through each stage of production. So next slide, please. So we'll start with development. Um, usually this is when you're conceptualizing of the project. You have a topic or an idea and you begin to frame the project, deciding which formal elements and methodology you will use for your film. Simultaneously, you're also doing research on the topic. That can mean watching other films, reading books, talking to people, going to archives, et cetera. It's just information gathering. We recommend that you stay, uh, you keep your research very organized and hopefully it's something that can be iterative. There's nothing worse than remembering that you read something somewhere in your research, but now you can't find it. So it's very, very important at this stage to stay organized. Um, during development, you can also begin securing access to your locations and your protagonists. This can include going on location scouts to get a sense of the setting for your film. It can include starting to get to know the community members who you may want to feature in your film, or you may already know the people you want to film but can start having explicit conversations about their potential participation for the film. That will be um, an ongoing conversation that you keep having with your participants, so it's always good to start this um, early. You may also find that through this process, the people that you initially thought would be a good would be good to film um, may not be the right fit for the film for one reason or another. So you really want to give yourself plenty of time um, for the development and access to your participants. And finally, during development, you should also begin fundraising um, or at least your fundraising plan. Um, as you're developing 
uh, your framing and your methodology for the film, it's often helpful to actually start answering some of the general questions on applications, like what's your story summary that's often um, asked in about a thousand words, or what's your artistic approach? Sometimes that's a little bit shorter, like 500 words. So there are things that will inevitably change as you continue to work on the project, but if you want to start applying to funds, then you should already be documenting ideas and the proposals in a format that will help serve for writing applications and fundraising. Um, as a first time filmmaker, there are grants specifically for emerging artists and you can focus on grants for research and development as well. Just a little note, often research and development grants will allow you uh, the funds and time to go to research shoots in order to deliver a sizzle or a trailer. I know we talked a little bit about that yesterday. Um, this practice is more common actually outside of the United States. Um, sizzles and or trailers are also most commonly put together before the actual production starts. So that's all that can be happening during development. So if you're doing all of that during development, then what's left for pre-production? So next slide, please. Pre-production, um, this is the stage where you're planning the act of production for the film. So production is generally referred to as the moments when you are filming and on set. In a funded timeline, in the most ideal world, um, you won't have starts and stops that sometimes fundraising requires. So pre-production, if we were to do it consecutively, it would take about a month. Um, if we're breaking it down in days, that's five days per week for four weeks, so about 20 days. Um, and this is something you can add into your budget. Pre-production is the time that you're signing contracts with the locations that are uh, you scouted during development. You should also be renting out the equipment or at least planning those rentals for when you're shooting. Um, Pre-production is also scheduling out the days you will film based on the time that you have the location, participant availability and the weather, especially if you're going to be outside. But even when you're inside, you know, the sunlight can be affected by a foggy day. Um, so it's really the time that you're crossing your T's, dotting your I's before you go into production, because once you start production, that's a train that won't stop until that you finish that shoot. So at this time, you may need to add more staff to your team to help you with all of these responsibilities. You may want to hire a line producer or an accountant to keep track of the books as you plan out the shoots and start to spend money. You may also want to add a PA to help with odds and ends, um, tasks to prepare for the set, and or an associate producer to help you with some of the rental contracts and location agreements. Um, your producer can also help with that if that's somebody that's already staff. So I've mostly been talking about this process of it, as if it's a one-stop shop, um, but with pre-pro for all of the shoots you will have for the production, that takes about a month. And so the way we broke it up into the 20 days, that's probably the most accurate for um, a feature length film. It can be shorter, it can be longer. It just really depends on your production. Um, sometimes, for example, you'll only have two shoots to plan for and you don't actually know that you'll you, you can't really plan out all of the shoots that you'll need so maybe that could take four days out of your uh, budgeted 20 days of pre-production um, and then you have 16 budgeted pre-production days left for the rest of your shoots in the future so just want you to think about how much this is a process of like you go into pre-production, you go into production, and then you might come back to pre-production again. So just thinking again about those um, intermittent timelines. All right, so now we're, we're done with pre-production. Let's talk about production. Um, next slide, please. So production is the stage that indicates that you've already started filming officially for the film. So if you did research shoots for the sizzle, that filming is not officially considered a part of the production or it ha it's not considered as the start of production. But sometimes research filming does end up in the final cut. Sometimes that, that research filming is a great scene that you got and you want to include it in the final product. So you want to try to keep a high production value uh, during research filming too, just to those options. In most nonfiction films, production does not happen consecutively. More often than not, you'll have to plan several shoots and or shooting trips that will encompass production. 
And um, this isn't always a budget. Sometimes you're just waiting for life or events to happen to your participants, or maybe a big event is planned in the future, like a court date or a, a certain big event, like a concert that you may want to film. So even if you have the crew and funding in place, you may still have to wait um, for that shoot to happen. So some produ productions choose to use their in-between time and between active production to actually start ingesting um, the edit and making selects. So after you have filmed, usually an assistant editor will help to organize the many filmed files and add them to the editing software, such as AdBit, Premiere, Final Cut Pro, etc. So once again, organization is really, really key here. You want to label and organize your visual files in a way that allows you to find those scenes when you're looking for them in the edit. As the assistant editor is organizing the files, the folks in charge of the creative direction, this could include the director, the producers, the cinematographer, um, and or the editor, could also be pulling selects. So at the same time that they're organizing the files, the files are becoming organized, this creative team can also be pulling selects. So this is a process of choosing the strong clips that have been identified in the in in both story that the scene is doing or the clip is doing something interesting and quality, and they could be good fits for the film. So you already start to sort of pull between all of your visual files, what are good quality files that you'd wanna keep um, that probably will end up on the film. And so you you start selects. So this is something that can be done um, even before you've finished all of your production. Um, and then, Something separately that you should always be thinking about is the fundraising, right? So now that you maybe have selects, you've seen what you've filmed, you're understanding your story more, um, you can actually be developing the story more and then also updating your application material. So your story summary has clearly changed, your artistic approach maybe has changed, your methodology maybe has changed your crew has maybe expanded. So you want to make sure that you're also updating those like application materials for potential fundraising um, in tandem with all of this that's happening. So when there is that downtime, like we talked about yesterday, you want to be doing these um, downtime tasks, so to speak. All right. So um, once we're done with production, um, we will enter into post-production, which I talked about a little bit already, but if you don't mind moving to the next slide. Um, so once you're done filming the main production, you have officially entered post-production. This is a great opportunity to essentially rewrite your film. Um, you know, there's an idea that you had before you started filming um, as to what all of this would look like, the events that would play out, what you will investigate and, and hopefully get some answers to. Um, but now that you've filmed, you actually have that material. It's no longer in the potential, it's now what you materially have. So this is a moment to sit down, hopefully with another person. It could be your producer, it could be an editor, if you were able to hire an editor, to actually start rethinking the structure of the film and what the material requires out of you and not necessarily Necessarily impose, right, what you think the film has to do. So you're really taking stock of what you have, um, and then you go into this editing process. Just a little note for context, um, usually in the U.S., when we post-production, we include editing in that process. Often, especially in Latin America, but outside of the United States, um, sometimes that means only finishing costs, um, such as color or sound, after picture lock. So you want to just be careful with those terms, depending on where you're using it. Um, and then finally, on the side, um, or simultaneously, um, this is another great opportunity for the last round of fundraising, right? Maybe at the beginning of your production, you had applied to some grants that maybe were some declines. Um, but now you're at a stage where you actually have the material you are working on some scenes, you have different things to show. Maybe the story has developed a lot. Maybe you've gained more access to things. And so this is a really good moment to 
reapply to those grants that were originally declined because now you have something different, developed, more uh, progressed show. Um, and then you could also start focusing on the grants um, and also labs that are more for like works in progress or rough cuts or, um, you know, just in the later stages of things. So there are definitely grants that are targeted specifically for post-production. All right. I'm seeing a little bit in the chat that I was talking too fast. I apologize for that. Um, but happy to answer any questions. Um, this, this is basically a good overview of um, the stages of production. So now I'm going to hand it off to Abby. How do I navigate funding and pitching since I've been talking about it so much? All right. Thanks, Maria. Took me a bit to find my unmute button there. Um, so we're going to refer back in this section to the funding sources document that we shared as a brief preview yesterday. I just put the link to that in chat. And um, I saw lots of questions in chat also about the recording of this session. Yes, be a little bit patient. Um, the three of us on screen who also developed this workshop were all the people doing the behind the scenes work. I'm running the slideshow. We just need a few hours <laughs> to put together all of the links after this session today. We will send them out to everybody who's joined us. And next week, we will post the recordings on YouTube. OK, so I'm going to start with thinking about funding first with you all. I'd love to hear um, you know, if anybody in chat has had any experience with any of these funding sources. So first of all, I'm going to go through the handout with you all and explain the particulars of it. And then we, I'd like to talk through just some of the options that folks want to talk through. Um, it would be, you know, a, an entire film school class to go into the intricacies of every single type of financing structure or financial support that one can get as a filmmaker, uh, but we'll do our best to kind of hit on the most important parts today. So, um, yeah, we're curious, even if it's not within these categories, I'm really curious who here has experience with what type of funding source, and I'm curious if you have any questions about any of them. So I have here from Victoria, through a fundraiser for the documentary I'm currently producing, which funded our first filming trip out to Norway. That's wonderful. Yes, yeah, so uh, throwing a fundraiser event is a way of securing individual donors and also of generating um, things from friends and family. Yeah. Um, I also see um, grant funding, university funding, which I assume that's usually uh, research funding or in the form of grants. Um, so grant funding only grants. I'm currently APing a doc and actively applying for all types of grants. Yes, that's something that an associate producer does a lot of, writing a lot of grant applications. Um, received a Canada Council Arts grant. Um, Megan has experience with equity investors. Um, that's uh, something that I think a lot of people want to get into. So Megan, if you would like to expand, I'm all ears. Um, any tips on how to do a GoFundMe campaign? Okay, so um, I'm going to actually show a preview of um, what this funding resources document actually does. So first of all, we have a, so this is not a pros and con document, to be super clear. What we've assembled for you here is we hope it's a way of considering helping you work through what you would and would not like to pursue for your current project, ways of thinking about what you gain and what you lose with every type of funding source. And what you gain um, and what you lose, so this is the trade-off framework, is not necessarily directly equatable to something that's positive versus something that's negative for your project. Um, 
So for example, um, what we hear a lot, especially from first time filmmakers, from beginning filmmakers, and especially because yesterday we uh, got some requests about from folks who wanted to work, um, or maybe are feel like they are stuck working in the ultra low budget range, under $10,000, under $50,000, People have lots of really different definitions of what low budget, micro budget, no budget means. Um, and you, we hear a lot people saying, oh, I made my film on no money. I made my film on under $10,000. Um, and I actually would argue that these are actually deferred costs and self-finance films as opposed to films made on no money because oftentimes in the accounting for these budgets we're not actually accounting for the time that is put into it. I argue it's my advice that it's important to structure the accounting of any of your projects to um, make sure that the money you have donated or invested in your project um, and that the time that other people in yourself have donated, um, whether it is self-funding or deferred fees or in-kind, is actually recorded somewhere. Instead of saying something such as, I'm going to make it on no money or I'm going to make it on under $10,000. If you actually account for the amount of hours spent on the films, it, it would be an extraordinary, I mean, it would be like an iPhone video. <laughs> Um, that perhaps would be be made um, at that amount of money. Um, for me, this also allows for others to more honestly understand how much a film actually costs to make. And it also acknowledges the labor that's been contributed to the project, whether that's your own or your collaborators. And also finally, budget totals affect later investments for those who are interested in pursuing equity investors who are interested in selling the finished film later. Um, the budget total has a really big impact on how investment returns are calculated and how investor credits are also assigned. Um, the Documentary Producers Alliance, who we referenced yesterday with their crediting guidelines, also has best practices for waterfall guidelines. And again, waterfall, as you can see on the slide here, is the order that investment returns are allocated back to the investor class. That could be just the director. And if it's a director producer, you made it with you know, no, no investors, um, but it could also get a lot more complicated once there's more, more things um, in the, in the queue. All right, so I'm just going to go over, for example, um, you know, uh, something that, I'm just going to go quickly through, stop me if there are any questions. Um, chat has now uh, become <laughs> a lot quieter. So stop me if there's any question. Um, and I see things popping up in the Q&A too. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go really quickly through how we imagine this workshop might be able to help you. So if we look at the self-financing part in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of this slide that we are on, um, so self-financing, we give examples then in the second column of what um, could be counted as this type of financing. Um, this self-financing could be putting the cost of production or post paying an editor onto a personal credit card. It could be um, that you already have a source of personal wealth and you are investing your own equity into the film. It could be working a day job and putting earnings from your day job, whether that is teaching, filmmaking, or working in the arts sector or something completely unrelated, um, like painting houses or construction work or waiting tables, which is what I did for a few years, and putting your earnings into your film project. And it could also be, um, so this is something that we don't talk about a lot, 
It could also be debt financing by getting a business loan against um, the film project and any future proceeds and profits. Now, that is usually only possible if you have relationships with broadcasters, if you already make a pre-sale, you can take one pre-sale. So, for example, one can sell your film part of its rights to a really specific place, a broadcaster in a specific country, um, a distributor that only does a really narrow type of distribution. And you can take that deal to a bank and get a business loan um, assuming that you're going to have further future profits. It's kind of like remortgaging your house, for example. Um, so I'm not saying that all of these things are what we recommend for every single project, because um, what you gain is artistic freedom when it comes to self-financing. You are the one that is making all of the decisions, securing the money. Um, so there's no restrictions on your funding from the point of view of the you know where you're getting the money from because it's yourself but you are incurring also you're gaining potential financial debt and any associated incurred costs if you're not able to make the business deals on debt financing um what you lose so this is related to incurring potential financial debt you lose personal financial stability um, your credit score for example um, and also without a buddy accumulated wealth, you also lose a lot of time. You have to secure the business loan. You have to um, spend time on the day job, so on and so forth. So, um, but this is to me a more honest accounting of what it takes to put together a low or micro budget film. Um, okay, so we have some questions in chat. I'm going to move on a little bit because this is really a handout for you to examine and to look into. So for example, I have a question. Can you elaborate on what equity investment is and how does it work? I'm gonna answer this right now. So we have the equity investment column here. Um, and equity investors are individuals or companies who take an ownership stake in the project. It's You can think of it as like venture capital investment, but instead of investing into a company, they invest into a film project. And what happens is they pay a certain amount of money upfront based off of what they think the worth of the project is, but then they also get any a certain percentage of any returns. Now those things are not is what makes it complicated. I mean that sounds easy. Somebody invests, you know, a five percent into a film project. Um, assuming the worth of the film is it's going to sell for $200,000 to a broadcaster. 5% would be, uh, I mean, I can't do the math this fast. 5% uh, would be uh, $10,000. And um, and then if it sells for $200,000, you might assume that they get $10,000 back. But that's actually not how it works. Um, and this is what makes it complicated. Equity investment needs to favor um, people who they they structure things so that it favors people who take risks. The first money in is typically a smaller amount than later investments, but they also get a bigger percentage of the return. And when it comes to the waterfall, the first money in, um, they are the almost the last people, it's kind of last money in is the first money out when it comes to waterfalls. So this is what makes it really complicated because oftentimes the real first investment is the director or the director and the producer, but they fall down to the very, very end of the waterfall. Um, in order to read more, I really um, advise you to look at this handout closely you can see that the equity investment column, there's a link. And that's because it is so complicated. We don't have enough time to go over everything in this uh, presentation today. Um, so we've linked to another workshop that IDA has done in the past. It's a panel discussion specifically on equity investment. And I highly encourage you to um, take a look at our handout and click on that link and do some more investigating and research for yourself. Okay. Um, all right. So 
Let's see. I'm going to move on for now because we've got a lot more to go through and I've spent, I've been hogging up the time. Um, so, okay. Funding in the U.S. Just some things to keep in mind that make funding in the U.S. unique. We see a lot of folks joining us from outside of the U.S. today. Um, so this is especially pertinent to you, but it's also pertinent to U.S.-based filmmakers so you understand a little bit um, if you are going outside of the U.S. to seek financing, what might be different? So we actually, I, I just a little bit of a warning. It seems like in the U.S. we have a lot of grant funding and uh, that can be really attractive because grant funding is non-recoupable for usually there are recoupable grants, but they are very rare which means that the grantor is not going to ask for any money back if you sell the film after it's finished or before it's finished. Um, there's a lot of grant fine funding in the US because even our government funding often comes in the form of grants. But I would say they're not necessarily the best use of time, especially for first time filmmakers, except if you look for grants that are especially targeted at first time filmmakers. Um, and the reasons for that are because of a lot of what you lose in the grant application cycle. They take a long time to put together. They um, have really long cycles of review and disbursement for the money, even after receiving a grant. Um, and uh, they're really almost a lottery the grants, because there are so many upsides to receiving one, receive hundreds of applications and a very few are selected and chosen. So it's not really a very um, kind of um, expected or stable source of financing. That being said, there are some upsides to applying for grants. The structure of a grant application can help you with the development of your project. So if you're applying for grants for that reason, I highly encourage it. But if it's for applying for grants as a source of financing, um, it's, it's not so reliable. Um, secondly, for the non-US folks here, the US does not usually grant in the US and funding sources in the US do not actually require a US-based co-producer in order for you to qualify for our financing. We get a lot of questions from filmmakers asking about how can I find a US co-producer? And the answer is, I mean, if you want connections and relationships, of course, those are always good reasons um, to hire a co-producer as Maria went over yesterday. But if it's to be eligible for applying for funding and grants in the US, very few applications and grants actually um, require US co-producers. So um, people just assume that that's not a requirement. What many US grant and foundations do require is a fiscal sponsor. And what a fiscal sponsor is, it's just a way um, for a 501c3 to give a film project 501c3 nonprofit status without um, the filmmaking team having to go through the long laborious process of applying to be a nonprofit themselves here in the US. The fiscal sponsor also provides fiduciary oversight. So they check to make sure that any money that is dispersed to the film project, the filmmakers are spending it on what they say that they're going to spend it on, AKA the film project itself and not, for example, um, a, a scam or or whatever. Um, okay, so that is kind of our U.S. documentary funding tips. From here, I'm going to move on to thinking about pitching. And here, I'm going to step back a little bit. So I mentioned yesterday there are um, really formal pitch forms and um, uh, uh, project markets where um, one can go. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But I, I really advise you to think of pitching quite broadly. Um, pitching is um, not only talking to someone who is obviously a funder, like uh, Maria Santos, our colleague, who is also presenting in her role as program officer of IDA funds. 
Um, but pitching, or another way of talking about describing your project and finding collaborators, is also something that you can do in very informal settings. Um, this is why the the elevator pitch is is a term. It can be to the way that you think about talking to people that you meet after a film screening who seem to have similar affinities to you. It can be how you describe your film project to um, people that you meet in chat here in this presentation. So when we think about how to develop a pitch, you really need to tailor your pitch to the funder and to the environment that you are in. If it's something informal, then you should be informal. It's a, it's a place where you have a shared point of interaction that's not just the film project. I would highly encourage you to think about um, how to form a longer term relationship even beyond your film project. Especially for more formal settings, you can practice your pitch, practice, 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 um, pitch in front of your friends, get those nerves out ahead of time so that when you are in an unexpected or, um, uh, you know, uh, an unexpected situation and informal pitch, you're able to convey what you want to convey. If you are in a more formal pitch setting, even if you don't win, or even if you, um, uh, don't get the money that is at the end of a pitch. Being selected for pitch forms often increases the visibility of your project and can help you connect with other potential supporters. And also always at the end, the Q&A portion of a formal pitch or um, asking questions or any questions that people ask in informal pitches, to me, those are the most generative spaces. We advise you to maintain graciousness, um, I will say I have attended some pitches where there have been broadcast commissioners um, who have been of, of, of a gen different generation, <laughs> I'll just put it that way, who ask some really insensitive questions. Um, that's okay. Maybe you don't want to partner with them anyway. Ask questions back of yourself and always send a follow-up email. And... Um, one more thing, because we're, we're talking about very industry-oriented spaces, these formal pitch forums and markets are not the only ways to meet potential funders. So the photo that we're looking at here is the old setup for IDFA, the documentary film festival in Amsterdam, which is the world's largest documentary film market. This is what the... Um, IDFA Forum, which is the granddaddy of all documentary pitches. This is what it looks like. So you can see there is a filmmaker standing in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, there's a large audience, that's only a quarter of the audience um, behind watching. It's, it's also a spectacle, it's entertainment. But as a producer and filmmaker, you can also attend pitches to learn um, how other film projects are being received by all of the funders and commissioners sitting at the table. It looks a little bit different now. They basically made the table smaller, but it's the same amount of funders. Um, and so you can see this is a very um, formal setting and it can be very intimidating, but uh, this is not the only way to meet financiers. This, in fact, this is only suitable to projects, I would argue, that are quote unquote broadcast ready, so on and so forth. And it doesn't fit um, everyone's project. So, Nancy, this is IDFA, the International Documentary Festival Amsterdam, which is in November every year. Okay. So, to help you figure out um, where to go for funding and different opportunities for artist development, whether that is pitches or project markets or things that might be um, less gladiatorial and a public spectacle, such as artist development labs, mentorship programs, so on and so forth, um, we uh, have created a worksheet for you for you to help organize your research into funding market and artist training activities. Um, so we're going to put, give us a second, we're gonna put a link to this blank worksheet into chat. And um, here is a sample filled out worksheet, which I'm just gonna spend about, try to limit myself to 30 seconds 
to explain how you could use this. So again, this is a filled out worksheet. So for example, on the left-hand side, if you are researching um, different sources of support, so we have Catapult here, they're located here in the US, they're in the Bay Area. Um, info, this is stuff that you should write for yourself. You need fiscal sponsorship in order to apply for their grants. Um, but they don't just only have grants. Many of these organizations have multiple activities. So for example, under Catapult, you see research grant and development grants, as well as the Rough Cut Retreat with the True False Film Festival. For example, under Point North Institute, we can see they have, now they have what looks like six different fellowship opportunities. They have a film festival, and they also have a project market at the film festival, which is the Point North one-on-one -on -one meeting. We advise you to take notes on suitability, whether or not your project is actually eligible based off of the eligibility requirements for these opportunities, and to take notes. For example, if you notice, Catapult only has research and development grants. So we wrote here in a sample notes example, really likes early stage projects, has one open call deadline a year. They used to be rolling. Usually the deadline is in the fall. And that's a way to help you organize when to spend your time on pursuing certain opportunities over others. And then um, I'm sure there's also other questions. So how do you find out about these opportunities? Um, in the worksheet, in the top right-hand corner of the blank and our sample worksheet, you will see two links. One is a link to the IDA grants directory, which is our database of over 500 grants with their eligibility requirements to the best of our ability, because sometimes they change and it takes a lot of work in updating over 500 listings. Um, but you can sort and filter by eligibility requirements and any specific interests the funds might have. For example, you can sort for first-time filmmaker and emerging filmmaker. And then the second link is the Documentary Association of Europe's calendars of labs and markets. So they have calendars of the deadlines for applications to project markets, artist training and development programs. And beware, not all of them are free, like this workshop series that we are holding today. Many of them charge money. So today's calendar makes it really clear if it's something that's free, if it's something that filmmakers have to pay for, so on and so forth. So, Amy, the link to the IDA grants directory is in the worksheet that we just shared, and you can also look on our website. All right, so um, I've gone way over my a lot of time. So with that, I'm going to um, hand it off finally to Gabriella. So, Gabriella, we've been talking about funding and pitching and all of these things about securing money. How do you have any tips for how I should budget my project? Oh, do I? Thank you, Abby. Um, yes, I do. Uh, and so to begin with, this is budgeting 001, by the way. So, and I wanna be clear that this is also not a budgeting workshop. We don't have a budgeting template for you, but we do have um, one from 2019 that we are uh, going to share in the chat from Robert Behar, um, but it might be a little outdated because it was from uh, 2019. So just to get that started. Um, but the, what are the benefits of budgeting from the beginning, which is something that you might not think that you should do if you're getting started? Uh, next slide, please, Abby. So budgeting can be used to help you set priorities. And it should also be a reflection of the ethics and the priorities for the film and for yourself, the film's philosophy and approach. Um, uh, and it can help focus you as well. You know, what, what are your priorities? Is it the crew? Is it something else? Is it cinematography? Is it mental health for your, for your cast and crew? Is it safety? And what, um, yeah, what are the priorities? What are, what are the ethics and how do they inform your budgeting process? Um, 
It can also introduce restrictions and knowing that up front is really good because you don't have these like, you know, uh, ideas, these grand ideas of what you'll be able to do. You come in prepared with uh, realistic, realistic um, notions. And in addition, it can inspire some really creative workarounds. Maybe you can't get that drone shot that you're going, that you really, really want to get, but what do you get instead from it? You know, how can you work around that in a cheaper way that maybe is more interesting and more original and maybe even fits better in the, the aesthetic of your film? Um, and also a budget will be required by basically every single funding source. Um, so uh, you're gonna need to have one in order to for all of those grants that Abby mentioned um, and all of the other funding sources in that worksheet that uh, you're going to research. Um, okay, next slide, please. So again, this is not a budget template. We're going to share in chat the Robert Behar Intro to Budgeting for Documentary, which again is a little outdated because it's from several years ago now. Um, but here is a non-comprehensive list of things to include while you're budgeting. And if there's something you don't see in here, please put it in the chat. Um, I love research resource sharing. Um, so again, think about what your priorities are when you're making your budget. Um, and so some things to think about are your schedule and how the schedule informs, um, you know, informs your, uh, your filmmaking process and how your filmmaking process uh, informs your schedule. There's a lot of variables at play, right? And what we discussed yesterday briefly is working on a nonlinear schedule. So you might go from post, you know, all of the phases of production might happen interchangeably. They might happen at the same time. Maybe you're filming something that takes place over a long period of time, um, or maybe you only have a month to make the film. And so time is going to inform how much money you need and how much, you know, how much it's going to cost. Also thinking of what type of film you're going to make, you know, that an archival project is going to cost a lot more than say an observational film. Um, a feature is going to cost more than a short. So these are all things to keep in mind as you're getting into, um, as you're getting into the work. Uh, crew expenses, which we'll go over in the next slide, um, cost take up a lot of the uh, budget, which um, I personally think is good because we wanna be paying people fairly, which again, goes back to the ethics and priorities of the film. Um, thinking about overall costs, versus specific themes, how long is going to, um, uh, how long, uh, you, you know, what is the overall cost of the film going to be? Or is there a specific scene that is going to take up a lot of the budget? Maybe, it, you know, for whatever reason. Um, In-kind expenses, so that's anything that's donated. It could be your time, it could be film equipment. Um, and it's good to have those actual costs um, and knowing what's what's you know being offered in kind. There are practical expenses, uh, software, equipment, travel, food, craft, you know, crafty, um, and then finishing costs with you know making your GCP, doing color, everything in post production. And then while you should not be focusing on it necessarily at this current moment in time while you're beginning you do need to understand that there are costs after finishing the film. Um, assets delivery, distribution festivals often have, uh, you know, um, submission uh, fees, um, insur e and O insurance, yes, super, super important. Legal costs, that's great suggestions in the chat. Um, keep them coming. All right, next slide, please, Abby. Um, so, Here's something, as I mentioned, budgeting about uh, for your values, um, AKA crew expenses. Uh, and so if you think of anything else, put it in the chat. Um, uh, so crew salaries, as I mentioned, are often the bulk of budgets. 
And it is an opportunity that we have to pay people fairly for their labor, even the director and the producer. And I would say, as it says, like, you can do a lot of research for, for getting those rates um, by asking uh, the community and producers that you know. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of talk in the documentary industry about how it's not financially sustainable, which is correct. So how do we, you know, try to make that change? And what do we have to give up in order to maybe pay people what they should be earning as much as possible? obviously with some leeway. So budgeting for health and safety, think outside the box with that. You know, you might be filming in a dangerous environment, um, like a nuclear uh, testing facility or something. Um, and so thinking about those kinds of safety procedures that maybe you wouldn't think about uh, to begin with. Um, you never know what's gonna come up so you should have a plan. Also, you know, depending on the topic, including for it's kind of relevant to health and safety, but you might think about budgeting for uh, for therapy for your crew and uh, participants. You know, there's there's uh, if editors sometimes just have an onslaught of footage that can be really upsetting, and asking participants to kind of relive perhaps a traumatic experience can be really triggering as well. Um, and then again, research, research, research for up-to-date uh, crew rates. Um, really reach out to community. I think we keep reiterating the importance of community and um, it's really true. You can always, we all are in this together and I think documentary filmmakers are really willing to help when they have the time. Um, next slide, please. So now we have a few kind of budgeting tips. Um, we have, there are three kinds of budgets basically. One, the bare minimum, the aspirational budget and the magic number. So bare minimum is like what you, the very, very least amount of money you can, like everything goes wrong with funding, you have no funding. What is the least amount of money that you can try to make the like shoestring budget? Um, aspirational number is, you know, you get a lot of funding, you have a lot of support. Um, what would, if you had the ideal amount of money basically to do all, make all your dreams and wishes come true, what, do, what is that number? Um, and then the magic number is the lowest realistic number to responsibly make your film. Um, so it's not too high, it's not too low. You can pay people, you can, you know, think about all of the things that I mentioned in the previous slides. And again, many producers are uh, willing to share their budgets if you ask, um, but please don't share without permission, honor your trust. These are confidential um, documents typically. Uh, so tips, uh, we are running short on time, but Marina, do you wanna give us some tips for um, maintaining our mental health while we're navigating all of these very like stressful things? Definitely, yes. Um, and just to say like time is definitely its own stressor and to impart that onto everyone who's here, um, but we do wanna get to your question. So this is just a last nod to mental health that we can't emphasize enough. Um, we we believe we've gone through a lot in the last two days about how to structure, describe, and place your film project in a marketplace. So we are ending today's workshop on mental health again because it's a it's just it's a difficult process. It's difficult to start. It's difficult to continue. It's difficult to finish a, a documentary film, no matter what length. It just takes this perseverance. Um, and unfortunately, too long in our field, we've placed a lot of value, and not just in our field, I think in general, uh, we've placed a lot of value on that kind of like grit, like you can stay up till 3 a.m. or not sleep because you have an edit to finish. Um, and we haven't really talked about the challenges of and being honest about how lonely that can feel and other difficulties and challenges. Um, we just 
often hear the documentary filmmakers have to take a pause making films because of these challenges. And we're also dealing with a lot of real people, real topics. You know, you hear people say uh, documentary films can be really sad, although I think that's changing. And so, you know, we really want to emphasize that as much as we all have these goals, these ambitions, these works that need to come out of us um, to also balance that with a little bit of my mental health. So we have a few short tips for you, but also please look at that handout about mental health resources. There are more links in there that can just help you contextualize um, mental health as it relates to um, documentary filmmaking, because you're not alone. I promise you're not alone. It feels like you are, but it, you're not. Um, so just tips for avoiding burnout, um, therapy, or different types of that support that are not as Western, um, like that could be spiritual leaders or community um, conversations, but just some sort of therapy where you're externalizing the things that are going on inside for you. Um, also, we recommend that you seek out resources for managing financial stress. Um, this is something that over and over again is very taxing for filmmakers. Um, and so it's something that uh, you should be trying to seek out resources for that. Um, also, just remember that production creates its own different type of stress, right? When you have to be the person in charge for everyone's healthiness, safety, uh, like if there are, is child care, if there, there are so many things happening on set. And so to really take care of yourself during those days um, and then plan for some rest after your shooting days, that's just all things that can really, really help um, to just balance out the intensity and sort of that start and stop that we've been talking about. And then finally, yeah, seeking out reach resources to manage work-life balance. Um, there's a way that all of us are culture workers so that of course, translates into our personal lives. And so sometimes that feels like, well, what is work and what is personal, right? And so uh, that mixing can oftentimes be really beautiful and why I do what I do. Um, but it can also feel a little daunting and like the world is on your shoulders. So really think about um, how to build up some of those tools around what you need for your own mental health. Um, as you are thinking about this industry and you're thinking about uh, making documentary films. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, please do look at that mental health resources uh, handout and just a little tip and note, all of the handouts that we've given out, it requires a little bit of clicking. It requires a little bit of like your own research, your own curiosity, your own investigation. And we hope that's what you can do with the handouts is actually um, start to do your own research because that's ultimately what um, how we generated a lot of these materials as well. Um, thank you, Victoria. Love that you love a clickable handout. Um, all right, so I think um, we are done with the slideshow of things and we can actually move on to our questions. Um, and Abby, do you mind just going over the September 20th um, information just before, if some people have to log off or anything like that? I can, Absolutely. I, um, I am just uh, going to stop my screen share so we can all appear on screen again. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for all of your deep engagement and chat for following along. So a few hours after we end this session, everybody who registered for either session of um, this this workshop series, either of the first two sessions, yesterday's or today's, will receive an email to recordings of both sessions, as well as a uh, link to a project intake form. If you would like, so on September 20th, at the same time that we've been holding uh, these, these presentations, we will be spending uh, 90 minutes only on workshopping in the round all of your projects. We don't believe that we will be able to get to every single person who wants your project workshopped, and we apologize for that. But um, this project intake form is a way for you to work on honing that pitch 
Um, we will be asking for some very short information. We will be asking for a log line. We'll be asking for some basic information about your film project, such as how long do you intend for it to be? Uh, hearkening back to what we discussed in the first day, um, whether it's a short or a feature that you want to make. Um, we will ask for some basic descriptors of how you would describe your project. And we will ask you for what materials you currently have, though it won't be a requirement to submit anything if, for example, what you are working on right now is merely an idea in your head. Um, and then based off of that, we will spend 15 minutes on each project and you will get feedback and questions from the three of us, Maria, Gabriella, and I. Um, and uh, the one requirement is in return for um, receiving that kind of feedback and getting our eyes and ears and attention on your project is um, we will be doing it live in front of the audience so that everybody can learn from the experiences of receiving feedback and positioning, so on and so forth. Um, we highly recommend, there are many people who have attended this type of theater in the round workshop style that we've held before, who have told us that though their project wasn't workshop, they learned from hearing others having their projects workshop. They incorporated that advice and those learnings immediately and found great success with continuing to push forward their projects. So um, we don't have it ready yet, but just be on the lookout. For your emails, it will be your email address that you use to register for this webinar where you will receive that. And we will be looking for a range of projects to workshop. So don't be intimidated if you really don't feel like you have a lot. We want to workshop projects at many different stages because um, that's, I, we think, uh, diversity of types of projects and project stages and ambitions and budget goals, so on and so forth. Um, we'll be looking to um, so we're not going to be workshopping depending on like whether or not we would select the film to fund, uh, for example, it will really be uh, as an educational exercise. Okay. Um, all right. Um, we're going to run the Q&A. We're going to start the Q&A now. Feel free to continue to put questions um, into the Q&A box. Uh, we have a lot. So we're going to try to keep this a little bit brief today. Um, but I actually forgot, Maria, are you selecting yeah. the questions? Okay. Yeah, totally. Okay. And and I will just say, uh, we're going to prioritize the questions that are more applicable to everyone. We can't as much answer the questions that are specifically about your project, but if they are asking a broader question, we'll definitely ask that. Um, so this is a one for Abby. I'm wondering if a director runs his own production company and invests in his own projects through his company in the beginning, what type of finan financier should I call this? Self-funded? Yeah, so that that is, I mean, you are investing. So you, you are equity investing into your own project, but that is self-finance. And um, again, typically how the waterfall is set up. I, I'm As a side note, I'm not saying that this is fair, the way that film financing waterfalls are set up, I believe it's very unfair. And there's a lot of work that the DPA is doing to try to get the director producers at the top of the waterfall, no matter when they are putting in their own money. But if you are investing in your project and you are your first investor and you're the first money in, even if you are the equity investor, you're still at the bottom of the waterfall right now. Great. Another question from Rajvi. Um, as first time filmmakers, we may not be super attractive to funders because we haven't demonstrated we can handle large amounts of money before and finish the project. What advice would you give to position ourselves through language and application materials to signal that we would make a good bet? Thank you, Rajvi. I think actually what you're doing right now is a great example of how you ensure um, trust in you as filmmakers and for the project. So as background, Rajvi is somebody um, that has been, is producing a very promising project um, and somebody that I've had contact with before. And I know this is a big problem. Part of it is demonstrating persistence. If you can demonstrate persistence in kind of personal relationships and relationships with potential financiers, that helps make a case that you're very serious about your project and that you will continue to work on it with or without our support. For me, 
when I see what first time filmmakers do get financial support, investors, grants, so on and so forth, I notice that the projects are all kind of positioned in a way where the filmmaker says, I'm doing this with or without you. Are you going to join me? Um, and so it makes it feel like the financier is the one who's going to be left behind if they don't take the risk. Um, so part of it, I mean, I'm not saying fake it till you make it, um, but maybe fake it till you make it. Yes. Um, and actually, I'm seeing Tivoli is back. And Tivoli, um, I'm going to ask your question. Uh, Gabriella, how important are pitch decks for pitching and financing? And is the sizzle reel a part of that pitch? Um, I would say that uh, pitching is uh, and having a deck is important for financing. Um, but really, depending on the stage of your project, a sizzle reel may or may not be uh, important. We discussed this a little bit yesterday, but for instance, a trailer, if you're further along and have done a lot of uh, interviews, might not be as helpful as perhaps cutting um, full scenes uh, and sending that to, pit to um, funders instead. Um, Maria, as someone who deals with funds a lot, and Greg, do you have anything to to add to that? Um, not too much. I, it, you know, it, a pitch serves a function, and so does a sizzle. Um, so they're very helpful to have in a useful way to very quickly sort of communicate information. Um, but it's not absolutely necessary. And also if your production has fewer means, it's okay if you don't have one. This does become a little different in some international contexts in Europe and in Latin America. Pitch decks and sizzles are actually very common and a lot of uh, development funds will actually uh, give you money to develop a sizzle reel. So in the international context, it's a little different, but in the United States, it's not absolutely necessary. It's more of like a nice to have and a, and again, it serves the function of communicating quickly. All right. Um, Add really quickly. Yeah. In terms of figuring out what you need and what will best position your project in a specific context or environment, I would research other filmmakers. It sounds like Tivoli, you're talking about something that's a little bit more formal. Um, you can ask filmmakers who have been selected into those project markets. You can ask filmmakers who have received financing from a specific production company or a broadcaster. Just ask them what materials they shared with the potential funder. And that will also give you a sense of what they are looking for and how they make decisions. Thank you. Um, there, I'm, I'm sort of lumping all of these together, but some folks have had questions around impact and whether impact should be considered separate from your production budget um, and is impact even considered a separate stage? That's a great question. So we are seeing questions uh, at the granting and financing level about plans for impact. I'm sure that many of you, if you've gone through the system, you've encountered those questions. Um, there is a sense that the conventional sense is that impact comes after post-production is part of the distribution stage or even after the distribution stage, if we go back to early years of impact. However, if you listen to experienced impact producers and especially ones that are very involved with the community, they argue that impact actually needs to be a part of all parts of the production of the film itself. Um, so I'm actually gonna put a link in chat right now to um, uh, the um uh to to a panel that we did with some impact producers where they they discussed this. So um basically the the answer is it depends on the funder and who you're working with and you as a filmmaker. But in my opinion, if you are serious about impact, um then that needs to be taken into consideration as you are conceiving the film. Thanks, Abby. Um, another question about funding. I can only pay a nominal fee to some creatives who work on my film, example graphics, instead of deferred fees. I can make that clear during our conversations and put it down in writing, such as emails. I wonder if I need to sign a contract with them and make it clear on these contracts just in case. 
So uh, technically, a, a an email stands up as a contract in court in the U.S. Um, and so, and, and it is a form of a written contract. But if you would like to formalize the relationship and um, make sure that all expectations are clear, you can do it in a work for hire contract or a work agreement. And there are templates for that online as well. I don't have any off the top of my head, but I'm sure if you Google it, you will find templates. But um, oftentimes I'm, I'm not sure that the most, especially if it's a low budget project, a really formal, like legal heavy approach might not be the best relationally for your collaborators and for the people that you're working with. Sometimes it might be better just to have a very clear conversation and then send an email afterwards saying, hey, thanks for that conversation. We agreed to this. I really appreciate it. So you have that down in writing, but you're not slapping someone with a really scary looking work agreement, which has things like they give you the rights for you to use your their name in order for you to help publicize your project. Um, maybe you want to handle things more relationally. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Um, Gabriella, anything to add? No worries if not. Great. Okay, so I'm just going to pull up a, a note um, from Catherine from the chat that I think is important. It's just the balance between the active filmmaking of everything and then also the writing and, and actually being applications and all of those things. And Catherine points that sometimes you can get lost in the application writing of things um, instead of, you know, focusing on the production. And so we did recommend that there be simultaneous calendars so that you're not meeting moments where you're both in active production and then also actively developing your applications because that's that's a lot of work for a team. It's a lot of work for one individual. So um, yes, totally noted, Catherine, that um, there, there is a balance that, that we need to strike between those things. All right, pulling another question from the chat, um, or sorry, from the Q&A box. Um, oh. What's that? Can I just add something super Yeah, super? yeah, of course. Yeah. I think it also can go either way. In my experience, um, grant writing can also help focus your vision and focus what you actually want to make a film about. So that's another good thing to keep in mind. Um, at least that's from my experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's like a calibration that needs to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Susie Conley says, um, the protagonist of a feature doc I'm currently working on has asked to contribute as an equity financier and feels they are owed a share in the IP and net profits of the film. Will accepting money from them be perceived by the doc community as a compromise to the integrity of storytelling due to the financial relationship? As an alternative, would it make more sense for me to offer the protagonist a share of the producer's net profit, but to not accept their financing. I only bring this question up because the idea of also paying protagonists has become something that the field is talking about a lot. So would just love to open up that question. Yeah, thanks so much, Maria. And thanks so much for this naughty question. Um, the short answer is, uh, it depends on who is judging. Um, I will say that uh, paying protagonists and contributors to projects, it, it's something that has long been done for the rich and the wealthy and celebrity biodocs who are often paid to be in their documentaries. And it's something that has only been frowned upon when we are talking about um, films featuring um, people from marginalized communities, um, people who, um, you know, are... are uh, are the celebrities or the expert uh, testimonies in documentaries, so on and so forth. Um, so that by itself is not considered by most outlets, if you're looking to sell the film, as violating journalistic integrity. And certainly by the documentary community, we've gotten far more nuanced on that. I would say if you are paying someone, though, to say a certain thing, I mean, that's still going to raise some eyebrows. 
Um, so it really depends on the context and what it's for, so on and so forth. Receiving an investment, on the other hand, is going to put you afoul of most standards and practices and um, uh, conflicts of interest, um, rules and regulations at all major broadcasters and streamers currently, if you are looking to distribute a film in that way. The only one that it won't put you afoul of is actually Netflix, because they don't have any standards and practices or a conflict of interest um, policy. Um, although it might still raise eyebrows from their you know, acquisitions and their original documentaries department staff, staff people. Um, so what I would say though, is there are ways that people have gotten around that. Um, for example, sometimes um, it's, it's a foundation that invests in, puts money into a film and the film is about one of their grantees or their services, things and so forth. So I would just say, I, I'm not quite sure like what the situation is here. It can be quite blurry. Um, for me, I think the the bigger thing that you have in terms of um, that relationship, especially because it sounds like it was something the person in the film demanded and it doesn't sound like it's something that you want um it sounds like to me that there's more tension there that needs to be worked out like what is it that the person in the film is expecting from their experience and what it is that you can actually give to me it sounds like there's a deeper tension there thank you it's incredibly sticky so um, we can, I would keep asking this question to a variety of panels as well, just because I think folks are trying to figure it out um, as well. So uh, thanks. And then I will ask a series of questions that I think are just like shorter answers, um, a little bit of a rapid fire. So can a film with 50C3, 501c3 sponsorship accept grants and also accept funding from equity investors, or is it only one or the other? They can accept anything with a fiscal sponsor, as long as the fiscal sponsor is able to accept that money, basically, or the form of assets that are being donated or invested. Um, so it really depends. However, I will say um, for equity investment alone, you do not need a fiscal sponsor. Um, equity investors can often um, invest in LLCs. They don't have to have that don't have fiscal sponsorships. Thank you. Um, while budgeting, if renting the camera equipment um, for 70 days might cost more than buying it off for once, what's the right thing to do in this situation? I can answer this. <laughs> or go ahead, grab your own. Yeah, yeah. Also, it depends. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it depends, but um... Also, the benefit of buying your own camera is the potential to rent it out in the future, is what I would say. But it, again, it really depends on your project. I would say it's it's not just a positive, however. Like, it sounds like it might be a benefit to buy the equipment if it's going to be cheaper than renting it. However, if you have set up, it depends on the legal structure that you've set up your production. If you've set it up as an LLC and you're receiving grant funding for it, then technically it is the LLC that has bought the camera equipment. And if you, um, if it's a film that does not turn a profit, in fact, loses profits and you have equity investors, they can claim the camera equipment as collateral and as part of the the profit so on and so forth so to me the answer is it depends but if you are just doing it yourself and there's no financial or legal structure behind how you've set up the project then um yeah sure buy buy the equipment i mean but renting the equipment they clean it for you in between your rental stuff i mean just you know it, it depends what do you what do you prefer the convenience or the ownership This is um, separate. Um, so, well, actually I'll ask Victoria's question. I'm dealing with a, a director who is a bit money anxious. They're asking for a bare minimum budget that includes not paying back producers or crew. I'm not comfortable with giving them a budget like this. I want to avoid that number becoming the only number that they envision. Do you have any pointers on how to handle a situation like this? I mean, I think it's wonderful. It sounds like you really have an ethical core and you want to stick to it. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to stick to it. 
Um, I will say I have heard of similar situations from line producers who have to present really difficult um, items to their producers that they're working for or to directors. Um, I would maybe ask advise that you talk to them about some handy tips. But for me, my sense is that you really have to make sure that your values are aligned with the directors. You want to do this because you have certain values. Um, the director, if they don't have, if they have those values too, then it's a question of framing the conversation in that way. Are we going to make a production that values labor in this way? I assume because there is the potential of getting money, but the director is feeling that there is not. Um, is And if the director really wants to push forward the project, even without that kind of support, and you don't, then to me, that is, that's a deep enough rift that I would ask yourself if you still want to be attached to a project that doesn't share your core values. Thanks for that, Abby. Yeah, it's it's incredibly hard going into a relationship between a director and a producer. Um, is a lot of people say it's like getting into a partnership with somebody, like a long-term, lifelong partnership, because there are all these ethical, values-based decisions that have to be made along the way. And so um, if you're truly not seeing that that values match um, with this director, it might be a moment to think about whether that's the right um, environment for you. All right. Um, this was a question that's been asked uh, broadly, separately in many ways, but how much should we pay a producer or a director? Um, some folks suggested 10%. Um, and then someone more uh, directly asked, how do we find estimates for budgets? And I think we've answered this, but I just want to hit home one more time um, what we did. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, there have been some documents shared in chat, and I, I do want to say we uh, will be downloading and sharing chat, so I, I correct myself from yesterday. So if you have lost the links, we will also be sending that out in our email later today. Um, there are links to several sample budgets that have sample rates. So the sample budgets include sample rates in them. And those are, at the time that the budgets were created, what would be considered industry standard rates. So it's not super high or super low, but for a project that is fully financed, this is what somebody would expect. Um, that being said, there's lots of ways to negotiate for crews, like people who um, if, if the editing period is particularly long and the editor really likes the project, it is easier um, to negotiate a lower weekly rate because they'll be working for longer than, for example, two months. They might be working for more than that. In terms of how much um, it should be paid, I've seen some people ask questions and people say in chat, that it should be 10% um, each for directors and producers. Another rule of thumb for projects that are financed is that the producing class, um, basically kind of above the line cost, so director producing at the producing class should receive 20% total. Um, to me, that is if a project is fully financed. Um, there are some creative ways that directors and producers pay themselves. Some of them, if they're doing it piecemeal, will kind of um, carve out different things. The, a producer will be paid specifically for doing the line producing um, work. A director will be paid specifically to be the sound recordist on her own film. That is, by the way, how Wiseman, Frederick Wiseman pays himself. None of his films are fully financed. Um, but he always he's the sound recordist on all of his films. He pays himself for that. He's also the editor on his films. He actually doesn't pay himself as the editor, but he pays himself a, a edit suite rental fee, which I assume is just his rent in his apartment in Paris. Um, so there are ways of like, you know, doing things if if it is a smaller production where people are putting on multiple hats and still making sure that folks are being paid. For me, it just really depends on your situation. And if it's a passion project and everybody's volunteering their time and everybody agrees to do it because everybody is starting out, well, then if there's no money coming in, then I don't know how anyone's going to get paid. So how do you share credits and make sure everybody feels that they are being um, acknowledged for the collaboration, the time that they put in? That would be where I would put your focus. Also, just I put it in chat, but from the perspective of someone who works as an archival producer from time to time, uh, especially pre-IDA, um, I 
am very willing to negotiate a lower rate for projects that I care about and for projects that really don't have a lot of funding. And that includes um, working far below my normal uh, weekly rate or day rate, but also having a flexible schedule to meet the needs of the production. So maybe they, I work one or two days a week or one or two days a month at whatever rate we decided so that they can kind of stretch out my time. Um, and I think that has been a really good workaround for certain projects who don't have as much funding. And then, you know, if they're ever fully funded and have a ton of money, suddenly we can renegotiate. But um, that's usually a, a produce. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I saw a message in chat, but yeah, that's a way to go around. I was actually just about to mention that you're already becoming hired. Um, that's great. And so with that, um, we still have some questions in the chat, um, but we do hope that we've encompassed as much as possible during our time together. It we We're a minute over. Um, and so we're going to start to wrap up. There were a lot of questions in the chat around um, the workshop and just sort of what materials we're going to ask for and then what we need to see before the workshop. Um, we're going to sit down and, and create a really clean email with all of the instructions and information about that. So we'll be sending that out to all of the participants um, again today or tomorrow. Please, please be patient with us. We are also waiting for the materials as they download and everything like that. So um, we'll be able to send everything out. Um, yes. Any other final words? I just want to thank our access providers for today. Thank you to uh, Pam for the caption. Thank you to Mara and Darcy for interpreting um, to ASL, American Sign Language. Thank you to everybody here in chat um, who has stayed with us. Um, and thank you to my co-conspirators, Gabriella and Maria, for being a part of this, this journey. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I want to reiterate thanking our access providers and Maria and Abby. And thank you all for coming, and especially those of you who really came to the chat and sharing your, your experiences and advice. It's like, it's really wonderful to see that kind of um, resource sharing and, and information sharing. It's true. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I'm really excited for whatever work you're going to make. Um, and that's, um, and also looking forward to like reconvening on September 20th um, to actually workshop, workshop some of these projects um, and progress them. So thanks everyone. With that, we're gonna close our- um, one, one last quick thing, sorry, yeah. Marie. Yeah, yeah, of course. Just to say, if you are looking for a fiscal sponsorship, fiscal sponsor, IDA does do fiscal sponsorship. So um, maybe we'll include that link in our email as well that information. Yes, we are one of the oldest fiscal sponsors that specializes in documentary films in the US. So all the expertise here is in-house. Yes, great. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Bye.